All right, on page 39, we're looking at uh, the attitudes, the godly attitudes in the Christian life, and I'm mainly going to talk about uh, the topic of pride and humility. Uh, and it is, uh, I think what intrigued me years ago was that I could read over that, any passage that dealt with pride, and I would just keep going because I didn't really think I had a problem with it. Uh, I thought uh, when someone said, uh, this person's proud, I thought of someone like Muhammad Ali, you know, in the ring saying, I'm the greatest and boasting before the world. I thought, now there's a, a pretty arrogant individual uh, saying, I'm the greatest. Someone who go around boasting on themselves, yeah, they, they need to stop there and linger for a while. But since I wasn't that way, was more uh, turned inward, uh, not going around boasting on myself, uh, I just thought, that's, that's pride, don't really have a problem with that, might as well move on. But I kept finding that topic of humility and pride almost at every hinge uh, in the epistles. Every time where we would go from practical doctrine to practical application, you find that attitude hit. Uh, in Romans 12, verse 3, uh, right there, boom, you're hit right at the turn. Uh, Ephesians 4, right at the turn in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, you know, have this attitude. Philippians 2, you, you just kind of start seeing this thing that, uh, this, this attitude of pride, and it began to pique my curiosity as to more what is this thing, pride, uh, and humility in counseling uh, it wasn't that I was dealing with two humble people uh, most of the time in counseling there were wars and fights and strife and I read the Proverbs and it said in Proverbs 13 10 behind strife is pride go hmm so a lot of the conflict that's going on and it makes me wonder you know here's Philippians 2 have this humble attitude that Christ had, and then you have Yodi and Syntyche coming up in chapter 4. Two ladies that weren't getting along in a church. Um, so it, it sort of piqued my uh, curiosity uh, more and more on this topic of pride and humility, which led me to do much more uh, looking into Scripture. It, it wasn't, uh, it's not the best selling book if you wrote something on pride and humility, uh, not in our seeker-sensitive environment. So you almost have to go back to the Puritan era to find individuals talking about pride and humility from a biblical perspective. So it's probably safe to say that humility is the one character quality that will enable us to be what Christ wants us to be. Uh, it, it is what we need to get along with one another. Uh, to grow, you have to have humility because God gives grace to the who? To the humble. And he opposes the proud. I think this is a pretty key attitude uh, to at least investigate. So here in the notes as we go through these, uh, I hope that it will make a sense to you as we just kind of flow through. Uh, first hour on pride. I'd almost like to spend two hours on it and let you linger for a week. Uh, but I don't have that, uh, that kind of time in the semester. All right, starting with some biblical terms. Uh, we're looking, uh, if you start first with the Old Testament, almost every Old Testament word that's used and oftentimes translated as pride, I came up with six different Hebrew words, and all of them, refer to a lifting up, a highness, magnification, presumptuousness. Uh, it's all about a lifting up uh, wherever you find the terms themselves. Uh, if you go to the New Testament, you get into two different categories. Uh, this One particular word group 
suggests the meaning of uh, a straining or stretching of one's neck, much like the Hebrew uh, terms, high, sort of high and lifted up, uh, to magnify or to be haughty. Then you get into another uh, word group here. The other category is a blindness, you know, like the word too fast, uh, uh, sort of a, a blindness. So sort of a, you get the, between the Hebrew and the Greek, you get this, um, they're conveying a high-minded, lifted up, and blind while you're up there. Now, either blind that you're not seeing things clearly, um, blind to your condition, but that's the, uh, if you just take the terms themselves on pride, uh, you're dealing with a high blindedness. Some biblical examples of those who are proud, you have many mentioned. Uh, Satan, uh, I don't know if you, where you're at on Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, whether you think they're re referring to Satan or not, or a double reference. But it's clear in Genesis 3, you've got a proud being who contradicts God, who says that God has not said and God is wrong here. That's just arrogance to correct or uh, say what God said is wrong, uh, regardless of your view of Isaiah 14 or Ezekiel 28, as far as lifted up and proud. Uzziah and 2 Chronicles, um, you have, uh, it's mentioned there that he when he became strong, this is 2 Chronicles 26, 16, when he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly. And we know what happened to him, right? With leprosy, and he died. Uh, and Isaiah 6 says in the year that he died. Nebuchadnezzar, his arrogance, uh, he was warned a year prior to that rooftop experience, uh, Daniel warned him uh, in that dream, humble yourself, and a year later he's on his rooftop and he just says, I, you know, this is Babylon, it was my idea, I did it by my hands and I did it for my glory. And then God humbled him, he was grazing in the backyard, uh, and then at the end of that period of time, he says, God is able to humble those who walk in pride. Daniel 4.37. Belshazzar, you have, uh, he didn't learn much as well. Uh, you have King Saul, who is proud and arrogant, who uh, chose to do what he wanted to do rather than follow God's commands. King Herod, Acts 12 is a sobering passage. When you have a pagan king who gives a speech, and the people say the voice of a god, not a man, and it's almost as if he says, thank you very much. You know, that, that was good, wasn't it? Uh, and it says God killed him because he did not give glory to God. A pagan didn't give glory to God. And so anything good we do, God needs to receive the glory. And that unholy trinity mindset, from me, by me, and to me belong all things, that is deadly. And a lot of God's children get into that mindset that, you know, I did this, it's from me, I did it by my own strength, it's by me, and, you know, I need to receive the kickback and the glory here. I need the attention. That's the glory goes to me. That, I mean, you, if God doesn't just zap you right there, uh, with worms, as he did with King Herod. God's view has not changed. His mindset has not changed, even if his ways have changed with us. You know, in the Old Testament, ground opens up and people drop down, right? They're, they're dead when they grumble. Well, we've grumbled. Aren't you thankful? He, some things have changed a little bit, but not his mindset on sin. And you see these examples, especially King Herod in Acts 12. Diotrephes in 3 John, it was all about him. 
in that passage. You, there are a lot of different warnings uh, in Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 8, uh, there's a warning there to Israel. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. You know, when our heart gets proud, we, we do tend to forget him. Uh, you may even forget to uh, say, Lord, give me this day our daily bread because you know there's food in the cupboards or in the refrigerator. You know, and you just kind of get in that mindset that, you know, the paycheck's going to come and everything's going to be just, and you, that's a proud way of thinking that we don't understand our own dependency on God every minute of the day and give him glory for all. Proverbs 16, 18 Pride goes before destruction. I think you have that there. And a haughty spirit before stumbling. Proverbs 21.4, haughty eyes and a proud heart. The lamp of the wicked is sin. And Philippians 2, 3 and 4, probably the, the key verses, if you wanted to go to, on this attitude of humility. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Absolutely nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. And do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. So you get into this, the, the biblical warnings for this, and I was just glancing a few people who have talked about pride through history. St. Chrysostom said, Pride is the mother of hell. Uh, you don't really have to say, St. Chrysostom, you know, what, what exactly are you trying to say there? Uh, it's pretty clear. Uh, J.C. Ryle, in his book on Thoughts for Young Men, said, Pride is the oldest sin in the world. Thomas Watson said, An angel is a knowledgeable creature, but take away humility from an angel and you have a devil. Uh, that humility is so key. More contemporary people like Swindoll said the world's smallest package is a man wrapped up in himself. And Amy Carmichael said those who think too much of themselves obviously don't think enough. You know, it, it can be a bit humorous. Uh, I came across a letter from uh, John Berridge, uh, the Puritan. He was writing a letter to John Newton. Uh, in 1771, and this is what uh, John Berridge says. It's recorded, by the way, in J.C. Ryle's book, Christian Leaders. In his letter, his note to John Newton, he says this, quote, The foulest stain and highest absurdity in our nature is pride. And yet this base hedgehog so rolls himself up in his bristly coat, we can seldom get a sight of his claws. It is the root of unbelief. Men cannot submit to the righteousness of Christ, and pride cleaves to them like a pitched shirt to the skin or like leprosy to the wall. No sharp culture of plowing and harrowing will clear the ground of it. The foul weed will be sure to spring up again with the next kindly rain. This diabolical sin has brought more scourges on my back than anything else. And it is of such an insinuating a nature that I know not how to part with it. I hate it and love it. I quarrel with it and embrace it. I dread it and yet suffer it to lie in my bosom. It pleads a right through the fall to be a tenant for life and has such a wonderful appetite that it can feed kindly both on grace and garbage. It will be as warm and snug in a cloister as a palace and be as much delighted with a fine prayer as a foul oath. Well, that's, that's some deep thinking there on the topic of pride. So as we go through this, uh, you get into the area of pride defined. Uh, it's self-worship. 
Now let me just uh, try to give a working definition here. On page 40, uh, you should have a, a working definition. Let me just get this up here. The mindset of self. It's a mindset rather than of a servant. It's a focus on oneself and the service of self and a pursuit of self-recognition and self-exaltation and a desire to control and use all things for self. It, it is all about oneself. That by you, from you, by you, and to you belong all things. And that, that, that mindset of self, and that, that's what typifies the flesh as well. All about self. But it's a master's mindset. It's coming here to be served rather than to serve. And so that's how you'll view people, is that uh, you deserve for them to serve you. Now, I used to think it was just boasting, but there's a flip side to uh, this arrogance, this pride, and it's self-pity. Self-pity is an interesting thing, and I, that's where I fell into. I'm not walking around boasting I'm the greatest. It's a flip side where you're still all focused on yourself and you're looking at what you can't do. Uh, you're cutting yourself down in order for those around you to say things that give you strokes. Have you ever been in that kind of thing where, you know, I can't do anything, really I can't, you know. And, and people around, especially parents, get manipulated to where parents go, oh, you, you, you can do that, you know, you're so good. No, not really. And a few more times, okay, that's enough for today. It's insidious. You know, our world calls it self, a low self-esteem. And these people are the wannabe boasters. Right? They're the wannabe boasters. They're still all consumed with themselves. It's all about them. But they... They're not at the place where they're going to go around boasting. And it's, a, it's the flip side. It's self-pity. So when people, quote, tell them, oh, you can, you're, you're wonderful, you're this, it's like pouring gasoline on a fire. And there have been times, and I know it's just probably the flesh at work in my life, that when I hear people say, you know, I can't do, I can't do, I want to say, yeah, you're right, you can't. And just see the reaction. <laughs> um, what? What do you mean? You can't? You know, it's one of these things. That I've been there. Know this this whole thing of ma manipulation and stuff. And but it's all about uh, pride. It's the wannabes. All right. So back the definition again. It's all about self focus, pursuit, and desire. Over the years. Uh, I have just been trying to unpack in my own devotions, my own walk with the Lord, how is it manifested in my life? This pride, this self-focused, uh, it shows up in my marriage, in my parenting, and I mean, every, all of life. And it, I hope you are at the place here today that you don't have a problem saying there's pride in your life. Uh, it's there. It's just where is it and how much? Because you can't, totally get rid of it here. You know, that would be glorification. And we're not there yet. So, a lot of these manifestations, just my own personal uh, thinking through the scriptures and how they apply in my own life, and then in ministering to people over the years, you begin to see some of these things manifested as well in their life and in counseling and marriages. And um, So this is just a sample. And we'll go through these uh, rather quickly. You probably would hope that I would go through them really quickly. But you think about it, if a pastor does not have a humble attitude, that church is in trouble. All right? And that's why it's so key and why I want to address this here in pastoral counseling. Uh, and even through seminary. I mean, you are accumulating so much knowledge so quickly that without the application of it, pride is an, an epidemic because knowledge alone puffs up. So without the 
manifold, you know, manifestations of application in your life and humility. Um, so as I go through these, just say, Lord, you know, if, if it be true, uh, I need to acknowledge this, confess it, and repent. Uh, complaining against or passing judgment on God. Contending with God. And we may not voice that verbally, but God knows our thinking when we're angry at him for what he has providentially allowed. A lack of gratitude. Uh, just um, people who are not thankful, uh, giving thanks always for all things. It describes the unsaved in Romans 1. They're unthankful. But Christians can become those who lack gratitude for what God has given, what he has done. Anger. A proud person is often an angry person. Things aren't done the way you want them to be done. Uh, people aren't working according to your schedule, your timetable. Uh, people aren't serving you as you think you deserve. You know, that all about self. Uh, but anger really is a, um, a good indicator that when you are angry, and let's say most of the time it is unrighteous anger, it, it's sort of a, a tip-off that it, it's about you. All right? And some people internalize it, and they, they're moody. Uh, moodiness... Um, is anger turned inward? It's called silent murder. And it's a form of saying, you'll pay. You know, you'll pay. Uh, you'll regret what you did because I'm not going to talk to you. That moodiness, withdrawing and pouting. Another one, seeing oneself as better than others. Usually, again, that goes with pride. You're up top looking down at people. Another one, having an inflated view of your importance, gifts, and abilities. That's uh, Romans 12.3. Don't think more highly of yourselves than you ought to think, but think soberly. Number six, being focused on the lack of your gifts and abilities. That's that self-pity, the wannabe. Perfectionism. People don't think, that's not a virtue, by the way. You know, people say, I'm just a perfectionist. That's awful. It's awful to be around someone who has a perfectionistic attitude. And that is, it's a, a standard that exceeds what's written. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 6, when Paul said, you know, don't, uh, don't exceed what's written. You, got, you have standards higher than God's standards. And everyone has to conform to your standard. And people go, oh, I thought you're supposed to do everything excellently unto the Lord. Everything. A perfectionist doesn't do everything that way. Only a few things. What they want. So you think, well, if I, the key is to be faithful in everything and do your best in everything that God has given you. And that way you won't get into perfectionism. Uh, a perfectionistic individual will leave a lot of mandated things by God undone in order to achieve one or two things they want done. Talking too much. Now that's, that's what I'm here doing, uh, talking too much, uh, but that's what I'm, I'm, uh, I delight in doing in a classroom, but that's what they're asking me to do in here. But when you're not forced to talk on something or uh, you're not the teacher or something like that, when you're around other people, do you do most of the talking? Or are you interested in their lives and drawing them out? You say, well, I'm married to someone quiet. Draw her out. Um, talking too much. It's usually because people think they have what they have to say is more important than what anyone else has to say. Or that they may even think that others are incapable of contributing to the conversation as well as they can. Watch out for that one. 
You know, in your uh, Bible studies or in ministries, when you're not up teaching or preaching, when you're just with people, are you drawing them out and, and asking them questions or it's all about you? That's something, to, uh, a manifestation. Another one's talking too much about yourself. And on and on it will go back to self. Even when the subject changes, it comes back to you. For some, how did it get off that back to this person? And it's amazing how a person can manipulate the conversation back on oneself. Uh, it's a humorous um, cartoon on Garfield when he says to uh, the pet Odie, the dog, he says, you know, I, I'm tired of talking about me. You talk about me for a while. <laughs> It's, you know, somehow, as long as it's all about me, we're all right. Uh, seeking independence or control. Um, you know, for me to want to be sovereign, I want to be in control of things. I want independence. I don't want to submit to anyone. I don't want anyone my, to be my boss. That kind of mentality is a proud thinking because we're all in submission to Christ and the governing authorities. But the flesh really wants independence, and we weren't created to be independent. But seeking that, uh, I don't need anyone, I don't need accountability, I don't need anyone in my life, I just, I'm my own boss. Watch out for that. Being consumed with what others think. Now that's, the Bible calls that a man-fearer rather than a God-fearer. but being consumed with what others think. Our world today calls it codependency. <laughs> but it's a manifestation of pride. When you think about that, and I mean, I used to par be paralyzed in homiletics. Oh, uh, Dr. Zemek could tell you some stories. Uh, I mean, he saw in me, you just name it, I was doing it. I was just every kind of nervous tick you can imagine, and I was just totally paralyzed. Uh, I mean, I, I burned those tapes, I think. I, I just got rid of them. Those, uh, you have to tape yourself. But I was more consumed what people thought than what God thought and what people needed to hear. It was all about me. And it, uh, if that helps any of you going through homiletics, um, been there. Number 12, being devastated or angered by criticism. You know what this is like. This is, uh, you ask someone, uh, could you teach Sunday school class, you know, for the toddlers? They need, we need some help there in our church. And they do. And so you sit in, you just want to see how they do. And afterwards you go, you know, I, that was wonderful. You, I mean, you appreciate your willingness to do that. A couple of things that will really help. And they go, I quit. <laughs> I, I, I want to just to, you know, if you just do a little bit more, uh, a few things differently for toddlers, you're going to uh, keep their attention. I, I quit. I'm devastated. You know. I, people like that are extremely proud. See, rather than welcoming input and constructive criticism, that's it. I've had it. Another manifestation, being unteachable. We're... Uh, one thinks they're superior, they can't learn from anyone else, and you'll have to watch that because uh, you'll, you'll have this tempting thought, oh, I've been through seminary, what are you going to teach me? Especially to someone in the, as a layman in the church who hasn't been to seminary. And, oh, watch it, you know, we can learn from anyone, even children, and just to be careful of not getting to the place where we're unteachable. I always take notes and, Lord, teach me through whoever it is that's using your word and, and teaching. Even negative examples, you can learn positive lessons. And just to continue remaining teachable. Number 14, being sarcastic, hurtful, and degrading. Now, again, this is on top, cutting people down. Uh, Sarcasm has a way, if it's uh, used in an unedifying way, that you can lower people and in your mind lift you up higher with a smile. You can even laugh. But that person has just been 
lowered. And they might laugh, and then they're thinking, whoa, that hurt. That just, um, it was unedifying. It was degrading. Watch out for that. Pride will do that. Um, a lack of service. Proud people want to be served rather than to serve. Or if they do serve, it'll be in places where they get recognition. You know, can I teach? Well, here, could you first maybe help set up some chairs? I don't do that. I, I'm, I'm trained to teach. I need to be up front. I need to see. watch the lack of service or serving only for recognition. I don't mean if, you have, uh, if you're gifted in different areas, just be willing to serve all the time. A lack of compassion. Uh, God is full of compassion. This is sort of, uh, I find this more among men who say, I'm not the compassionate type. That's my wife. You know, I just tell it like it is. I, I don't, uh, you know, my child falls down. I just tell him, get up, you know. Bleeding, just get up. M move on. You're not, nothing's broken. Uh, you want the compassion? Talk to my wife. I, I'm not the compassionate type. And what I say is then you're not like God. You're not like Christ. Because Christ is full of compassion, so you have a long ways to go. You need to start learning how to be compassionate. And start working on that area of care and concern. But that's usually pride-driven. Being defensive or blame-shifting is a manifestation of pride. Someone will bring up, you know, I don't think you were being as loving as you should be, or if you're married, your wife says, you know, that was not kind. Me, not kind. What do you think about, and you turn it quickly onto them? That's just pride. You know, rather than, do I have a log that I need to deal with, or am I going to go right after their speck? In Matthew 7. A lack of admitting when you're wrong. How long does it take you to admit that you've sinned? Some will go days, some will go months. And uh, some marital counseling. Uh, a lack of admitting when they've sinned. You could, I, I, mean, I think I could keep coming up with more of these all day. Uh, a lack of asking for forgiveness. Because uh, you have to humble yourself and say, I've sinned, please forgive me. A lack of biblical prayer. Uh, uh, emphasis on biblical prayer because the Pharisees would pray to be seen and heard but a biblical prayer where you humble yourself and Lord God be merciful to me you know the sinner resisting authority or being disrespectful um, part of being humble is recognizing the authorities in your life with respect and honor Voicing preferences or opinions when not asked. <laughs> uh, a proud person uh, is just not able to keep their preferences to themselves. And they'll come into churches, they'll come into marriages, and things are going to have to change in here because this is what I want. It's not what God says, it's what I want. And uh, wherever things are being done, they have to voice their preference on the matter or their opinion, even when they're not asked. The preferences are usually voiced without much compassion or thought of anyone else. I can remember one Sunday uh, getting ready to preach, and uh, my wife, uh, we were back in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, you know, where it's 100 and 100, 100 degrees and 100 degrees, I mean 100% humidity. So in the summer months, you just, you try to keep cool. And so my wife uh, had her hair cut uh, shorter, not a crew cut. I mean, it wasn't Fort Jackson here in Columbia, but it was just, it was just shorter. It was off the, the shoulders, uh, very nicely done. And we were greeting people coming into church. And one guy came in, a visitor, and uh, I, I met him. And I said, here's my wife. Um, and... Uh, he goes, oh, uh, hi. And he goes, I, I don't really care for women with short hair. <laughs> I, 
I didn't ask what you cared for with women and their hair. But he had to voice his preference. And I think it took me half the preaching time to finally get back in the spirit. <laughs> and I, I'm trying to remember back whether I even changed the whole message uh, to, to look at him. I, I, you know, we've had people come into our home and, and tell us how they would rearrange furniture. To, uh, uh, you know, I, I, you've had people like this, I mean, in your life who will, uh, will just voice their preferences and you don't even ask them what their preferences are. Uh, it's, a, it's a manifestation of that a person's consumed more with themselves than the interest of others. Um, some really have an, an epidemic here of it. Minimizing your own sin and shortcomings, and that goes right along with the next, maximizing the other person's problems. Minimize your own, maximize theirs. Manifestations of pride. Being impatient or irritable with other people. Again, why would you be impatient with people? It's they're not doing what I want. You know, when God is long suffering and patient with us. Being jealous or envious. You know, worry that uh, you're going to lose certain blessings, or envious of others. Why do they get that? We're the ones who need it more than they do, and it's this envy and jealousy. Using other people. Uh, you think about your friends. Are your friends uh, only those people who give uh, towards you? Do you have any friends, any people that are that are in your life that don't serve you. It's interesting, isn't it? You start thinking, boy, you know, if people aren't doing something for me, I don't have any time for them. That's a, you start, boy, do I use people? Are, are people um, in my life to serve me, or am I in their life to serve them? Being deceitful by covering up sins and false mistakes. You know, covering up sins. Pro and Proverbs 28, 13, you will not prosper. Another one, using attention-getting tactics. Uh, doing things to draw attention to oneself. It can come out through dress. How a person dresses. You know, I want to be different. Why? Why do you want to be different? Well, people will recognize that I'm different. Ah. See, part of being Christ-like is that you decrease and Christ increases. So you, you sort of want to get out of the way and reflect him more rather than draw attention to oneself. Some people are loud and boisterous. Some people act rebellious to get attention, uh, especially at home. Not having close relationships. Proud individuals. Uh, it's, it's hard because it's two in love with one. You know, it, It's uh, difficult to have very close relationships. Uh, you'll hear people say, I don't need people. You know, I'm, I do very well alone. Um, I don't need people. And uh, they tend not to hurt when others hurt. They tend not to rejoice when others rejoice. They're just not close to people. Well, relying on your own understanding. Well, let me go back up there. And experience rather than God's word. You know, I think, well, what's God say? Well, what's he say in the scripture? Well, I think, you know... My understanding experience, I'll rely on that more than God's word. That's problematic. Or unwilling to seek help when needed. And unwilling to receive help. You think about that one. When someone says, here, can, can I help? No, thank you. Uh, uh, we don't, I can't. I can't have you bring a meal over. I can't have, no, please. What is that? When people are reaching out, 
Now, it's another thing to say, a person says, here, I'd like to bring that. And you say, no, I mean, I really appreciate you doing that. But we have plenty. You know, I, that would be different if someone says, let me bring a meal over. No, uh, you know, there was another time when my you know, wife was sick and, and there's like five meals in the freezer um, that, that people did. Thank you. We, we really don't need it right now, but I just really appreciate your willingness to do that. But the person says, no, you can't. I will not accept anything from you. Or we'd like to come over and help clean the house uh, if you're in the hospital. Oh, no, no, no way. You can't come into my house. Can't do my laundry. Can't. What is that? That's pride. You're, you're not letting other people serve you. Um, and it, at first, it seems like you're being humble. But in reality, it's more about yourself than allowing other people to be blessed by giving. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Approaching God's word with a voter's mentality. Well, isn't that a popular thing today? You know, what's God say about it? I'm just, I just want to know whether I'm going to do it or not. I just want to know what he has to say. You know, like it's a smorgasbord. Uh, it's not, you don't vote on his word. So, and then et cetera. I mean, when do they stop the manifestations? It could go on and on and on. Um, Now, there are various promoters of pride. I'm not going to spend the time to go through all of these. Some of them are very self-evident in your notes. Uh, the promoters of pride, self-esteem, self-love, self-confidence, you know, self-assertiveness today, uh, self-assertiveness training, self-rights, legalism. You know, where it's all up to you and to keep your standing with God type of thing and works righteousness and Pharisaism where you get so caught up on external looks that you miss the heart uh, and what God is looking at and doing things to be seen. The proper response is to confess the sin of pride wherever it manifests itself, to repent, and put on humility. And we're going to look at that in the second hour on humility. But let me just uh, highlight something here. Uh, why I would like to just go another hour on pride. Because it's not if we have any. It's just where is it and how much is it. Um, but linger there a bit. Don't say, well, I maybe have a few of those things. Not too bad. Let's just move on uh, to the topic of humility. Uh, I, mean, I was impressed uh, a couple years ago reading through the book of Job on how the Lord in chapter 38, here's Job, something happened there. At uh, first he didn't sin. And then as time went on and his friends kept going at him and he's not making sense of what's going on, he began to and he begins to contend with God. And then the Lord speaks up and he says, are you going to contend with the Almighty? And, and he goes for two chapters of one question after another. You know this. You're know, familiar with the book of Job. Two chapters of one question after another. And he's not even asking for dialogue here. He's not even looking for an answer from Job. Because it's obvious what the answers are. <laughs> And after two chapters, Job just says, all right, I'll keep my mouth shut. You know, you got my attention. And it, it's almost as if Job's ready to move on. I got the message, let me just move on. And the Lord says, stand still, I've got some more for you. And for two more chapters, he goes, more questions, one after another. And at the end of four chapters, Job says, I repent. I repent. There's, there's a definite change, and God knows what he's doing uh, and how he addressed Job and what Job needed. And I would just uh, encourage all you guys, as I have done as well and continue to do, is just linger there a little longer. And so, uh, Maybe you need to, for your devotions this week, uh, review those manifestations. If you're married, ask your wife, just saying, you know, I've circled the ones that I see the most, 
but pride blinds. So I'm probably oblivious to some of the ways it's manifested in my life. I'd like to get your input on top of my input. I, I'd, I'd really like to no, know because I need to humble myself. I need the attitude of Christ. And uh, so to in, invite that, start it yourself, invite it from those close to you. Maybe it's roommates if you're not married. Children, if they're old enough and can uh, evaluate you know, how am I coming across in a proud, arrogant way? And linger there a bit and say, Lord, search my heart uh, and try me. Now, some of you might go, whoa, you could get lost in that one. I mean, you could get so deep in evaluating yourself, you could, you could become introspective. And I would like to just read this comment here and then we'll break. This is from Martin Lloyd-Jones in his book on spiritual depression on page 17. And this is what he says about what's the difference between examining yourself as a Christian and becoming introspective. Because as soon as you start evaluating yourself, it's like, where does this stop? And it's like a black hole. And I could just go down more and more and more and just not even want to get out of bed in the morning. He says this, I suggest that we cross the line from self-examination to introspection when in a sense we do nothing but examine ourselves and when such self-examination becomes the main and chief end of our life. We are meant to examine ourselves periodically. And, and uh, Richard Baxter says the same thing in uh, his book Christian Directory, when you self-judging you do it periodically. But if we are always doing it, always, as it were, putting our soul on a plate and dissecting it, that's introspection. And if we are always talking to people about ourselves and our problems and troubles, and if we're forever going to them with the kind of frown on our face saying, I'm in great difficulty, it probably means that we are all the time centered upon ourselves. That is introspection, and that in turn leads to the condition known as morbidity. So, you know, our, our end here is to be more like Christ, not centered on ourselves. Lord, where is it that I'm not like you? Show me in the mirror of your word. I want to confess it, repent, get my eyes on you, and move uh, towards Christ's likeness, and not just stay there and uh, forever examining yourself, it's periodic examinations which are um, more biblical. All right, well, let's take a 10-minute break and come back, and we're going to look at what we're to put on in place of pride and pursuing humility. Let's move on uh, this afternoon to the topic of uh, the endangered virtue, which is humility. And uh, I think we would agree that pride is on more epidemic proportions and humility is more of an endangered virtue. It's very rare. It's unnatural to man, apart from God's grace. Pride is what is natural to fallen man. Right? That's Romans 1. Uh, just refuse to worship God, worship self, unthankful. That's, that's what's natural to man. Unnatural would be humility, and yet it's the root of every virtue. So some biblical terms on the topic of humility. Uh, both uh, Old Testament and New uh, all refers to a bowing low, a bowing down, crouching, whether it's Old or New Testament terms. Servile, uh, it's a, just the opposite, as you can imagine, of pride, where it's, instead of lifting oneself up, it's bowing low. It's crouching down. It's having a low-mindedness rather than being high-minded. The examples... Uh, 
I mean, we could go through a lot of these. Uh, Abraham, uh, you're familiar with, uh, I mean, how it was displayed in his life where he uh, preferred a lot and a choice of where to go when things weren't working out. It just preference issues there. You have uh, Moses, uh, Numbers 12.3. You know what, as I look through these uh, names here, they're all leaders. Leadership uh, is not weakness. Leadership is strength in Christ. And you look at Abraham as a leader, Moses leading a few million people, and yet it says in Numbers 12, 3, he was more humble than any man on the face of the earth. And who wrote Numbers? <laughs> kind of humorous, isn't it? Uh, how that was all done. Uh, uh, John the Baptist, where he, you know, Christ must increase, I must decrease. I, I'm not even worthy enough to uh, untie the latchet on the sandal. His mindset, and yet bold, courageous, but it was in the strength of, of God. And that's what's key in leadership, is that your confidence is not in yourself, it's in, in God and in his word. Mary, the mother of Jesus, who just uh, in that um, description of her and even her response about being uh, going to carry the, uh, of Christ as a virgin, uh, she said, the, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done unto me, as you say, just a humble attitude. Even when she questioned God or the angel, it wasn't contending with God. It was just, or the angel was, how? How am I going to? How? How am I going to have a child? I, I, have, I don't. I don't have relations with a man. Uh, how am I going to have a? It was that question rather than Zacharias, who, when he questioned, it was a little different, right? When he said, "How?" Uh, with John the Baptist, yeah. You got the wrong person. You know, my wife's old. I'm old. Uh, it wasn't how is this going to be like Mary's how, and when she asked it, because he was he was uh, chastised. The tax collector, unlike the uh, Pharisee, the tax collector in Luke 18, uh, be merciful to me, and then definite article, the sinner. You have Paul in Acts 20, where he said, I. I served you, talking to the Ephesian elders, uh, I served you with humility of mind. That's what he told them. And here he was, a leader as well. I grew up with the phrase, uh, if you think you're humble at all, you're not. I don't know if you've ever heard that or if it ever has run through your uh, friends' mouths at all. But if you think you're humble at all, you're not. That is not biblically accurate. Because here's Paul saying, with humility of mind, I served you. That would almost be, if we're commanded to clothe ourselves with humility, then it has to be a process to become more like Christ. It has to be, you have to be able to carry out the imperatives. At least be growing in it. Now, for someone to say, I've arrived, you know, we know something's wrong with that. But to say, I'm growing in it, or I'm more humble now than I was, uh, at uh, the new birth, to say if you think you're humble at all, you're not, would be the same to say to an individual, if you think you're loving at all, you're not. Because we're supposed to put on love. But, you know, if you have that same uh, mentality that if you think you're humble at all, you're not, you'd have to do all the virtues and the fruit of the Spirit like that, which we would not agree with. But we would not say we're perfectly loving, we're perfectly humble, but we ought to be able to say, by God's grace, we're growing in these areas. So a number of examples there, and of course the greatest example is Jesus Christ. And Philippians 2 points to him. Uh, he had this mindset in you that was in Christ Jesus, and it goes through the whole uh, portion of scripture there, of uh, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be held on to, but emptied himself, 
taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And therefore also God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name. And then it, it continues to go on. Um, Christ came to be uh, to serve rather than be served, and yet he was a leader. He was the perfect leader. Uh, he led the disciples. So leadership and humility is how you do it, as far as a Christian leader. And even in the pastorate, you men are being trained and, uh, to pastor people. Humility is the mindset that we must have, just like Jesus. Now, if we go into humility defined, it's all about God worship. Uh, it's focused on from him, by him, and to him belong all things. It's uh, probably best summed up in the end of Romans 11 when Paul said, it, it is from him, by him, and to him belong all things. A definition would be just the opposite. Instead of a master's mindset, like you're a king, no, we're servants. And so our focus is on God. Our pursuit is in the recognition and exaltation of God, and it's the desire to please Him in everything and reflect Him rather than self. And this is what we're pursuing. You can't say no to self and leave it there. You have to, as we're denying self, as we're uh, doing nothing out of selfish ambition, we have to be focused on Christ and pursuing him. And it's all done by the Spirit of God's enablement. But let's think through here some manifestations of humility. What does that look like? Well, a lot of them are the opposite of pride in the Bible. But it's, first of all, recognizing and trusting in God's character. Most of the Psalms are all about lifting God high and bowing low. Uh, exalting God. And I don't know if it troubles you, it, it should. When people go to Psalm 139 as, um, for self-esteem. You know, look at me, I'm so fearfully and wonderfully made and uh, intricately made and it's all about me and that wasn't what David was saying it was when I look at me wow what a God <laughs> that created me so again recognizing and trusting God's character <clears throat> number two seeing yourself as having no right to question or judge an almighty and perfect God you don't contend with the almighty he's all wise you can't improve on his plan and now, no right to question him, not so much like Mary, how is this going to happen, but rather not to question him uh, like Zacharias. Uh, focusing on Christ is key both in salvation and living the Christian life, keeping our eyes on him. Biblical praying and a great deal of it. You know, Thomas Watson was the one who said, we pray all the time. We pray without ceasing because beggars beg. That's, that's what we are. We're beggars. We need God's grace all of the time. And so we beg. And biblical praying. Being overwhelmed. Oh, by the way, in our biblical praying, we're going to be offering up petitions on behalf of other people, intercessions on behalf of other people. It won't all the prayers be about us. And uh, praying for others, being overwhelmed with God's undeserved grace and goodness. Uh, humility is realizing I, the only thing I deserve is hell. So anything above hell is a blessing. No matter what health you have, what relationships you have, what condition, financial situation, doesn't matter. Anything above hell is a blessing. And so we're overwhelmed with God's undeserved grace and goodness. And we will be thankful and grateful for everything. You know, if anyone does anything for you, thank you, because I don't deserve that. Rather than, 
this, this is all I get? Couldn't you do better than this? You know, that, right there you can see the pride just pour out of that, rather than thank you so much. You know, guys, you just need to go home today and thank your wife, if you're married, thank her for marrying you. Because you definitely married upward. Right? I mean, the more you get to know yourself as you look in Scripture and you see how far we need to go to be like Jesus and we keep our eyes on him, uh, we realize, boy, God has really blessed us with the wife he has given us. Um, for you who are unmarried, you know, thank your parents <laughs> for the patience they had uh, towards you. Just thankful and grateful. Being gentle and patient with people. Gentle and patient with people. Realizing that's how the Lord is with us. Seeing yourself as no better than others. You know, as they say, the ground is equal, right? At the foot of the cross, we're just, no one is better than others. We're, we're gifted differently, but no one is better than others. We're equal in essence. And, uh, having an accurate view of your gifts and abilities in Romans 12, 3. Just a sober assessment of how God has gifted you. And don't say, I can't teach if you can teach. Don't say, you know, I can't if you can. If someone says, can you play the piano? Well, define that a little bit. You know what I mean? Are you, compared to who? <laughs> uh, compared to some people, it's almost like I can't play. But some people who don't know how to play, yes, I can play. So, you know, maybe ask a few more questions. But it, just an accurate view of your giftedness and abilities. For some, it's realizing an accurate view of your gifts and abilities so that you can avoid uh, being like a 40-watt ball put in a 100-watt socket. You know, where they're saying, here's a position, you know, are you the man? And you look at the position and say, no, I am not. Uh, it would take three of me to fill that, that socket. And I, it's just me. Uh, with God's help even, no, I'm not. <laughs> just an accurate view of your giftedness and abilities. Uh, being a good listener. You can see why this is an act of humility to care about people, think about what they're saying rather than what you're thinking up next. Uh, just being a good listener. Even with the word of God in James 1, being slow to speak, quick, quick to hear God's word even. Talking about others only if it's, for their good, it's good and for their good. And that's a tough one. We need... They ask God for his help to be careful what we're saying about other people. That it's good and for their good. You know, it was interesting. Uh, let me go back. <laughs> the other day, it's, it's just interesting. Some places you'll go and people just begin talking. And, uh, you know, where students will gather. And they can begin talking about individuals. Only to find out that the person they're talking about is, is there maybe in a, a, around the corner or right outside the door. <laughs> so it's good that if you're talking good and the person shows up rather than not so good and the person's there. <laughs> Being gladly submissive and obedient, I said that uh, because they were talking about a professor out at the college. It wasn't me, but they were talking about a professor out there and I thought, that professor, I, they could be me standing right there, right out in the hallway there, and, and I would have heard. If they were talking about me, I'd have heard it, but they were talking about someone else, and it, it wasn't the best. Uh, it may have been accurate, but it wasn't of good report. It wasn't a lovely comment. Being gladly submissive and obedient to those in authority uh, thankful for the authorities that God has placed over you and gladly submissive and obedient. Preferring others over yourself. This is all, these are all just manifestations of putting on humility or clothing yourself with humility. 
thinking of others' preferences over yourselves. And uh, one of you asked me during the break, you know, if you're married, what do you do if you say to your wife, where would you like to eat? And she says, it doesn't matter. And so you, you ask what her preference was. She said, it doesn't matter. So you end up going to the places where you like. And uh, I did that for a few years. My wife's so easy to please. And uh, then I asked her one time, I began interviewing her to just get to know her more. And one of the questions, one of the questions was, uh, what are your five favorite foods? And so I, I had this question in front of me, and I said, all right. And she said, well, let me see. My favorite food is uh, seafood. I'm writing it down. Next, uh, Indian food. Indian food. Uh, American Indian, <laughs> Indian, what kind of... And she said, no, no, uh, you know, Eastern Indian food. Uh, her roommate, her roommate's sister in college, uh, sister, her roommate's sister married Robbie Zacharias. And so there was this uh, uh, desire for Indian food. Now I'm writing this down, Indian food. Okay, <laughs> next. <laughs> And, and as I'm writing these, I'm thinking, we don't go places where there's th these kind of foods. We don't, we don't do it. And I'm thinking, oh, now I got it. I, I ask her where she would like to go, and she's just so easy to please, doesn't matter. But now I can say, all right, uh, which place would you like to go? One has seafood, one has this, one has that. What, you, you, you know, what would you like? So that's how you can live with someone when you get to know their preferences, uh, if it was just them. But that's one way of doing it with some people who are really easy to please. Get to know them more, and you can make choices according to their preferences. I learned that about 10 years into our marriage. Uh, being thankful for criticism or reproof. This is tough, because sometimes criticism and reproof do not come at you in love. All right? People just complain, and you're going, mm, that's, that's tough to take. I don't know what it's like in homiletics lab, but sometimes people can be brutal. Uh, do you have to do that and evaluate each other? <laughs> you know, evaluate like you would like to be evaluated. But some will, will criticize you and reprove you, and it, it may be the truth, but it may not be packaged in love. But you still need to be thankful for the criticism and reproof. And uh, knowing that this is, God has allowed this in his providence to help you, uh, to learn patience with people, and also to grow to be more like the Lord. Having a teachable spirit, Knowing that, uh, I think the most, most healthy attitude graduating from seminary is, boy, there is a whole lot I don't know. <laughs> I think that's one of the most healthiest attitudes. The more you see God's word and say, there is so much here I want to study for the rest of my life. There is so much I don't know. Uh, seeking always to build up others. It's the attitude of, I want to help others grow. I want to help others uh, be edified. In Ephesians 4.29. Serving, and a great deal of it. Just where can I serve? How can I serve? And Jesus came to serve. Everything he did with the disciples, even leading them, he was the servant leader. They're the ones standing up arguing who's the greatest, and he's the one bent over you know, washing their feet but serving others. Even our freedom in Christ is so that we could serve others. A quickness in admitting when you're wrong, and that's a test, a test of spiritual maturity. How fast when you're uh, approached about sin in your life or something that you committed, I mean, it was sinful, that you admit that you were wrong. And I think spiritual maturity is, is being very quick to admit your sin. 
but some will go days and some will just still refuse to admit that they did anything wrong when it's clear that they did some wrong. And uh, I asked, uh, you know who Ken Sandy is, who uh, had a Peacemakers International, uh, I think that's what it's called, Peacemakers International, uh, trying to help people with reconciliation and conciliatory type ministry up in, uh, I want to say Montana, Idaho, somewhere up there. Does that name ring a bell at all to some of you? Uh, he goes around to Christian organization and churches and things, and uh, it's a group of attorneys uh, who are seeking to bring mediation to uh, church splits and various things that aren't over doctrinal issues. It's just sin. And I said, what's the thing that stands out most to you among the leaders of when you go into those kind of situations? He goes, oh, without question, pride. You know, and just behind strife is pride. So a quickness in admitting when we're wrong, a quickness in granting and asking for forgiveness and not holding on to grudges. And someone says, I, I've, I've sinned, will you forgive me? Absolutely, absolutely. Repenting of sin as a way of life, that's just a humble attitude, you know, as... The Puritans called the Christian life. It's a life of repentance. We're continuing to repent. Minimizing other people's sins in comparison to your own. Now, that doesn't mean if you were unkind and your spouse committed adultery, you know, minimize their sin, maximize mine. And I, don't, I don't mean it in that kind of way. And I don't think that's what the Lord meant at all in Matthew 7. He's just saying, look, at first, deal with your log, then able to help them with the spec. It's just proportionate. Look at yourself. Minimize theirs. Maximize yours. Being genuinely glad for others. Now there's a real test, isn't it? Martin Lloyd-Jones said in Romans 12, 15, when he's preaching on that passage, he said, oh, how easy it is to weep with those who weep. But oh, how hard it is to rejoice with those who rejoice. You know, because that's, typically there's a, a blessing that's happened in their life and you're, it, it'll, it'll tug on your heart. Oh, they got that raise. Yay. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you've been trying to have children and, you know, they're not married very long and they're pregnant, you know. Great, you know. <laughs> It's those kind of things, or you're, uh, you graduate seminary and you get your resume together and you're ready, uh, churches, and you're sending it out, and first one, one guy, your friend, uh, classmate, sends out, boy, they just pursue this quickly, and you're year, two years. <laughs> and you know, when those things happen, it's a real test, isn't it? It's a test, and it will just um, reveal uh, our pride at times when we can't rejoice with those who rejoice. That's the place where we can genuinely be glad for other people. Being honest and open about who you are and the areas in which you need growth. And I, I tend to think, at least in our circles, there's not much openness and transparency. Uh, it, people tend not to talk much about where they're growing, where they need to grow, where they're not like the Lord, and they're in process. It's almost as if some think, am I the only one who struggles with sin? Has everyone else been glorified around here? And that's sad. You, you begin to wonder, if, is the church for those in process or for those who have arrived? And I've heard that. I've heard it in counseling and or they just don't hear many people talking about their growth or areas that they're working on by God's grace. Uh, possessing close relationships where you go more in depth with people, caring for them deeply, praying for them. In Acts 20, where Paul opened up his life, uh, 
he talks about opening his life up, his heart up to the Thessalonians. He talks in Acts 20 to the Ephesian elders of how he uh, cared for them. He, uh, day and night for three years, he didn't cease to admonish each one with tears. And at the end, in verse 38, while they're weeping, he's leaving and they're weeping. Uh, close relationships. We're usually a mile wide, right, and an inch deep. Um, well, going from pride to humility, it is a continued process called sanctification. And we humble ourselves, as James 4 says, just continually humble yourself. Peter talks about the same thing in 1 Peter 4. Uh, we learn to walk in humbleness. Uh, it's an attitude uh, in our walk with Christ. We pray for God to help uh, repent of pride and produce humility. Do you have these? Uh, you should have, yeah. I would encourage those who want to continue growing, I mean really putting some work here, growing more in love with Christ and uh, decreasing and, and uh, their focus on self, to read the Old Testament more. And, and I know, you know, I mean, uh, I'm not going to step on a landmine here, but uh, all of God's word is profitable for instruction, reproof, and correction and training. But the Old Testament is so uh, pictorial and vivid in its high view of God. It's not that the New Testament doesn't have a high view of God, it's just... You, you gain a sense real fast in the Old Testament that God is almighty, real fast. You, you, um, he doesn't tolerate sin. Sin, he hates sin. And it's that kind of view, you just see him high and lifted up, that you bow low. And that continues on, I mean, all through the New Testament. But that, it's... And you know if you're doing, reading through the Bible in a year or however you get through the Bible uh, and continue to read through it, that Old Testament, it just it, it gives us such a reverence of God, the fear of God. And I would just encourage people to spend more time in the Old Testament uh, as they're also, usually in the preaching, will be in the New Testament. Uh, study Christ, uh, his earthly example, how he's clothed, in flesh, in the Gospels, study him, watch him deal with people, watch him deal with the disciples. Um, he, to, this, is, this is God uh, in human form and how he deals with people and how patient he is when the disciples are saying, get the kids out of here. And he's saying, no, let them come. Let them come to me. And just how he is with people. It's a... Uh, such an encouragement to be like him. Ask others if you come across proud in any way. Now this is a, <laughs> you want honest people? Uh, ask others who are around you if you come across in a proud or arrogant way. And um, if they say yes, say how is it done? What am I doing? What, because I want to work on that. I, I don't want to appear that way. So give me specifics. Don't just say yes. Just give me some specifics and saying there are a lot of manifestations. Am I, am I doing these? Sometimes as we teach, we might do that. As we teach Bible study, as we preach. Sometimes when you're talking about people, and I, I, I'm, you know, there are times I fight this in the sense that I know I must come across arrogant, is when I'm dealing with false teachers, I hate the error that they're promoting, and sometimes it's like I hate the person too. And, and I know it's difficult sometimes to divide the two, but you have to be really careful there. What they're saying is dead wrong, and not go after the person. And how to do that, um, some do it very well in their critiques, when they critique things either in written form or in spoken form, but that'll be a challenge for us because we love God, we love his word, we want to keep true to it, we want to guard the truth. Um, and when we hear all the error and all of the 
the atrocious treatment of God's word. We'll name names, and it's almost as if these people are despicable, and we just have to be very careful there. That may be one place that those who love you and are close to you say, you know, it just seemed as if uh, you came across like you're way up and that person's way down, when really all you wanted to deal with was what was written and the, uh, the writing or what they said. It's, it's a real challenge. Number five, spend concentrated time worshiping God. It's all day, every day, but just concentrated time. And uh, worshiping him who's high and lifted up, praising him, uh, praying without ceasing, reading his word, and meditating on it, which then puts it into actions in your life. Practice the one another principles. Remember, because pride is more about self the one in others is all about how do I serve others. And there's over, what, 38 of them? I guess technically 43, 44 of them. But 38 that we can practice ongoing. Um, but practice the one in others. <coughs> Review them. One of the graduates from here a few years back, Andrew Jin, uh, did his uh, master's thesis on the one and others. All of the one and others, unpack them exegetically and into application. Uh, it's um, bound over in the library over at the Master's College, if you ever want to look at it. Did a good job practicing the one and other principles. Work to put off pride and put on humility at the level of your thoughts and motives, right into the, the area of your communication and your speech, and right on out into your actions and deeds. It takes spirit-empowered effort here uh, to put off mortifying uh, the deeds of the flesh and the attitudes, and it takes spirit-empowered effort to put on what's right at the level of heart, uh, mind, speech, and actions. But keep your eyes, uh, as one of you mentioned, uh, make sure that our eyes are focused on Christ. Have the mindset that humility must be a way of life. You're clothing yourself with humility the rest of your life. Um, so you see that dependency with the folded hands there, uh, even on this presentation. You see the sort of the arrogant uh, approach of this ship will not sink. You know, pride comes before a fall. Um, and we want to bow before uh, God, lift him high, and bow low. Any quick question that you might have on uh, the attitude here? I think it's critical in pastoral counseling, uh, critical for any person, but especially uh, those in ministry. Uh, we have to model this. You know, follow us as we follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ in this attitude of humility. Do you find humility as bowing low or prostrating yourself? Um, if it's done outside of a focus on God, is it always false humility then? Yeah, that's a good question. If, it, if your eyes are not on the Lord, and it's not before God that you're bowing low, you're just bowing low, uh, that's what you're asking. Is that a false humility? And I think it is. Uh, I have met people uh, in cultures, certain cultures, it, it, it appears like they're very humble, but you get, begin talking with them, or uh, I've been called into some uh, sort of like mediating work sometimes in other, uh, and I've watched culturally, it looks like they're very humble, but boy, when they're together, <laughs> it was uh, anything but humility going on. So I would, I would concur with that, that just the outward expression is not humility, it's a heart uh, attitude before God that makes it true humility. Yeah, it's a good, very good. Yes? Uh, to follow on what you said, how do you work within a culture that values an outward expression of humility rather than like the inward expression of humility? 
In other words, like they expect you to uh, show humility in their ways, or you don't do as they expect, then it doesn't come across as humble. Um, but you don't really feel like doing it. <laughs> yeah, when the, when the cultural pressure is to conform outwardly, which may not be wrong in the expression that they're after, but if your heart's not right, I would say pray that the Lord would make your heart right. Uh, now, if they're asking you to express humility in ways that really are are more manifestations of pride, then that's you'd have to deal with each of those situations separately. But wherever the external is really not the problem, it's the heart. We're to take care of our hearts and, um, and say, Lord, help me. You know, it's hard. That's, that's why we pray without ceasing. We need God's grace continually um, to keep our, our mind focused on God and serving other people. And again, it's not natural to us. It's a supernatural work of God. It's by His grace that this is done. But I, I want to encourage you all. Some of you are going, man, I'm just blown away. All I, I can see is my pride. I, uh, this is a, a small quote from Richard Baxter. Uh, in his Christian directory, he said, uh, one of the directions here about when you're when you're looking in the mirror of God's word and you see Christ, you see yourself, uh, and yes, we're in him, thank God we're in him, but we see the process and how far we have to go to be like him. This is one of his practical suggestions when you're, uh, when you're evaluating yourself according to scripture. He says, look not unequally at the good or evil that is in you. But consider them both impartially as they are. If you observe all the good only that is in you, and you overlook the bad, or if you search after nothing but your faults, and overlook your graces, neither of these will bring you to true acquaintance with yourself. And I think that's very well put, that don't just go, wow, I see all the ways I'm not. You also need to look at where has God graced you to be more like Christ in your life and say, thank you. I, I'm not where I used to be on that area. There is some growth. Praise God for that. And uh, yes, I have a long ways to go here. Thankfully, I'm not where I used to be. Look at the graces as well as the areas that we need to grow in. So hopefully that might encourage you. Um, well, let's uh, close in prayer. And again, thank the Lord for uh, that all of our sins have been paid for uh, and for his grace to continue growing. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time together with my brothers. I thank you that you have chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Uh, you have drawn us to yourself, uh, applied redemption to our hearts by the Spirit of God. Uh, we just thank you for the work that you've done. Thank you that positionally we are in Christ and nothing can move us uh, out of that. Lord, in this area of sanctification and to continue growing to be more like Jesus, I pray that our focus would be on knowing you more and being like our Lord and Savior. As we even look in the mirror of your word and we see uh, areas that um, really are hindering us from being more useful and fruitful for you, I pray that we might acknowledge uh, the pride, confess it as sin and repent. And I pray that by your spirit we would pursue Christ with all diligence and to have his mindset uh, as ours. Lord, thank you for the patience of those who are around us. If we have offended people, 
by our arrogance and our sinful attitudes and comments. Lord, may we ask their forgiveness quickly. May we take care of the log in our own life before we start addressing the speck in our brother or sister's life. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, do such a work in our hearts and lives that when this class of men uh, graduate, uh, that it might truly be one of the most humble classes that graduates from this seminary to be more effective and more useful in your church. And Lord, may you receive all the glory for anything good done in our life. And again, thank you for your grace and forgiveness. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.